Well, welcome to Walking in Spirit and Truth. We are so glad that you've joined us today. It is a cold evening here in the panhandle of Texas because we are supposed to get snow tonight. Well, we have been discussing Psalm uh, 23, and we were actually on verse 2 two weeks ago. We I'm, I missed teaching you guys last week because of various reasons, but we are here this week. And what we looked at two weeks ago uh, was verse two, and we're going to continue to look at that from a different perspective or two weeks ago from the paleo perspective. And we learned that as su- may be surprising to some that this Psalm is really about, or at least verse two really is talking about Shabbat and Yahweh removing the chaos from our lives because he leads us beside um, water. Still he leads us. And So we looked at it. Then I want you to go back and listen to that from two weeks ago. But we're going to continue and look at it from another direction right now, maybe more traditional. But I still think that you're going to catch some meaning and some depth in it that you may not have otherwise. Beside water still, he leads me is how you look at it in the Hebrew or water's calm. Let's first take a look at sheep because that's how we started last week or two weeks ago. We looked at sheep. And you think about sheep, they need a shepherd to lead them. Why? Do the sheep know where the best drinking places are, where the best water is, where this water that's not stagnant is? Do they know these things? No, they've got to have a shepherd. In fact, often the shepherd employs much industry, much effort in finding good water for the sheep. How much of a sheep is composed of water? Well, they say on average it's 70% of a sheep is as composed of water. So what do you need? You've got to have good water for metabolism. You've got to have good water to help the cells that the sheep do, and us too, for that matter, to help your cell and your body operate as they're supposed to and to make the functions of the body work correctly. Water for sheep determines its vitality, its strength, its vigor, and it's essential to its health and well-being. And ultimately, water is required for life. Now, I want you to think about us. We are supposedly composed of about 60% water. That's not a small amount for us either. 60% water. Have you ever noticed that when you don't drink enough, you get a headache? Well, you do because and you will even stop thinking clearly because you need water to maintain metabolism and the functions of your body as well. In fact, the brain and heart, those places that quote unquote think are 73 percent water. Your lungs are about 83 percent water. Your skin is about 64 percent water. Your muscles and kidneys compose of about 69 percent water. Even your bones are made up of 13 percent water. Now, we don't often think about bones being made up of water, but the point is here that we need water just as sheep are so that we can function as we're supposed to function. Okay. So if the supply of water for a sheep drops off, its body body begins to deteriorate. Dehydration of the tissue sets in and it does damage and can do permanent damage to them as well. And that also means the animal becomes weak and impoverished. So when a sheep is thirsty, they guess what happens? They become restless and they begin to set out and they search for water wherever they can find it. I've got to have water. I've got to have water. Well, I'm guessing maybe that's what the sheep are thinking or instinctually, at least they're going forward to find water. And if they don't supply, find a good supply of water, a good clean supply of water, They're going to drink from polluted holes and whatever disease and parasites are there are going to be what ends up. But that's why they need a shepherd because they can't do it on their own. So when David was writing Psalm 23, he was looking at it from the standpoint of a sheep and he because he was a shepherd. So David says he alone, Yahweh alone knows where the still, quiet, deep, clean, pure water is. And he alone can find the water that's going to satisfy those sheep and keep them strong and keep them fit. Well, it's the same for us. He alone is the one that's going to supply not a stagnant word, not stagnant water, but fresh living water uh, that that will keep us healthy and strong. Now, sheep ultimately can find water from three sources. They can get it from dew on the grass and deep wells and springs or streams. 
Now, I did not know this fact until we stud I was studying up on it, but sheep can actually go months without water from a body of water because they get it from the heavy dew that's on the grass each morning. So they rise just before dawn and they start to feed and, and they'll even graze at moonlight. In the early hours when the vegetation's drenched with dew, that's when they get a large supply of water for themselves. And if you think about it in the parched land that they're in, that fresh water in the morning is so important to them. Well, let's think about that. That fresh word that comes when we give him the first part of our day in that, in that morning time before we get the rest of our day going is going to satisfy us. It's going to cause the rest of our day to function much better because we have, we have been drinking first thing in the morning from that water as we've had our time with him. It's because dew is clean and pure. It's a good source of water. And the shepherd is the one that supplies that dew. He leads me beside still waters. He knows where the still waters are. He knows where the green pastures are. And yes, green pastures are Sabbath. We did look at that. But he is still, the point is the shepherd is still leading us. It is his job to lead us. It is the shepherd's job to lead us. All right. We continue on that vein. I want us to think about the word lead. Yenahaleni. Y-E-N-A. H-A-L-E-N-I. Okay. And you read from right to left. So Yenaheleni. Now the root word of that is Nahal, which means to lead with care. That means to guide, to guide slowly, to manage. But it specifically has this idea of leading or guiding one to the water. Rabbi Samson Hirsch says that it means to lead the one who is weak. So when you look at it in its PL form, it's a picture of lead here in this verse is this picture of one who has reached the point where you are completely exhausted. You are dehydrated because you haven't had the supply and you're in desperate need of water. Have you been there? I have. Now, if you think about the physical sheep in the Middle East, you think about pictures you may have seen that that seems very logical. But when we look at it for us, it is this picture of being so exhausted that you need someone. You need someone to support you or even carry you to waters that are going to refresh you, to give you that fresh word, to give you his word, to give you what you need for the moment so that you are supplied, so that you are no longer dehydrated, where your body isn't functioning correctly, where you aren't thinking correctly, where you've reached the point of exhaustion. Your strength comes from him. Okay. All right. So I have a question for you. If you want to hold that thought for just a moment. How many times do we in natural, in the physical life, we actually will become more and more dehydrated because we don't drink and to the point that we forget to drink to where we, um, we are really dehydrated. We really do need water and we don't even recognize that we need the water. And we need someone to come up beside us and say, you need to drink. You need to drink water. And you can do the different tests. I mean, you like you said earlier, the headache test. But, you know, there's the, the skin test where you can grab some of the skin and see how quickly it, how elastic it is. And will it go back into place or will it just kind of hold in place for a while before it shrinks back down to where it's supposed to be? I mean, we can do that. But how many, how many times we need somebody to walk beside us and say, it's time to drink. You need to drink some water. You're dehydrated. And, and, and I think about that, how we are as people, we are sheep. And if we're, if we are without the water of the word, or literally the washing of the water of the word, how often do we just recognize, we don't even recognize we're parched from with the word. We're parched. From we don't even it. we don't even know that's where a lot of our attitude or the problems are stemming from is because we have been become we've become totally dry because we have not been well, taking uh, in that word, that water. Yes. So let me take it to the next point then. Therefore, there is 
such a, a responsibility that rests with pastors and teachers, apostles and prophets and evangelists, all of them, on, honestly, all of that fivefold ministry, legitimately fivefold ministry, that is both old, both I would say uh, Tanakh and uh, Brit Hadashah. We can't discount any one of those. Very important. But when a they are speaking and they are in that position to bring the flock into maturity, it's important that they give water in order to quench the thirst. So, so it's important to gather the flock. But when that flock gathers, it's important to have something to to refresh those the sheep with. Uh, the role of the pastor in particular, because that's the role when we gather in the in in on the congregation, uh, in the congregation on Shabbat, that role of the pastor is to bring some refreshing water. People are supposed to feel inspired and encouraged um, after gathering. Also, they can be taught. Also, they they can be encouraged. Also, they can be exhorted to. Also, they can have those um, prophetic words spoken over them that strengthens them brings it, it inspires it and gets them to maturity all of those things working together is that water right and if a person walks out the same way that they came in then that pastor failed and i speak that way because as you know you and i sandy we take that very seriously if someone's coming to gather how important it is that when they leave they've got something yeah, but I don't think you can push all of that on the pastor either because you can you can sit in a congregation and expect nothing and receive nothing. And here that expectation is very important because there is that old idiom that says you can lead a horse to water, but, but you, you can't, can't force him to drink. And so there it goes two ways. Attitude is everything. A sheep's attitude will prevent them. Uh, and if you came, if you came just to find the newest nugget, or if you're sitting there for a performance or a show, you'll receive nothing. Mm -hmm. And that is not the fault of the shepherd or the pastor at the point. But, and so I, I there is a twofold responsibility because we are thinking living creatures as well. And it, it's also our responsibility. And, and some people hate this as a pastor. I'm going to say this and John and I, co-pastor our congregation together side by side once not over the other we we lead together but it is also our responsibility to say hey have you been in your word and i and that irritates people have you been in your word how often are you in your word have you spent time alone with the father have you spent time in worship and when you get no answer, no, 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 you're going to often find that those people are, quote unquote, dehydrated and dried up and are facing situations. Our job as pastors isn't just to bring a fresh word on Shabbat, to go over your studies, to bring a fresh word, but it is also to make sure or to remind them, hey, there's dew every morning, but you have to go, you have to go spend the morning and get the dew off the grass. Yeah. Every morning that dew is fresh, but you have to go out and put effort to get that fresh dew from the grass every day, every day, that fresh word spending time with him every day. So it, it, it goes both ways. It goes both ways. Yeah, exactly. It does. It, it, it does. And, and uh, now, a now sheep in the natural setting they trust their shepherd and and so yeah it is that the goal of that shepherd to to lead them to guide them down to that place where where that the peaceful water is that still water and and they're able to drink and yeah now, if we remember what I said before, waters represent chaos, and he is the one that removes the chaos so that we can rest. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at that a little bit more, too. And that all plays a part in, in 
what this picture is of the waters that are still and calm. Let's look at the Hebrew letters. But before we do that, I want you to really get this understanding that Yahweh puts his arm around, arms around you when at these waters still. He puts his arms around you to support you and when your strength is almost gone. And he guides you to that place of refreshment, those waters of refreshment, if you will follow. And that's another thing got to be the one that satisfies. We've got to stop looking at other things to bring satisfaction, to fill our time, to bring answers in our lives. When we have failed to go before our King, when we failed to allow him to lead us to that place of satisfaction. When we look at letters one more time, the letters of the word Yenahaleni, we have that picture of the, the Yod, the Noon, the Hay, the Lamed, the Noon, and the Yod. It's almost like this pyramid that's formed because we hear the repetition of those letters. And I talked a little bit out of, about it last time. When you put these consonant, the images with these consonants, we have, I think I said, the deeds and the life reveals the control of the de the life and the deeds. And so you have that, as I said, that pyramid structure. I think it helps us to understand what does it mean to lead with care? It's the deeds or the work of life reveal the control of a life of deeds. And it means that basically the things that we're doing are going to reveal where our life and the work is coming from. Yahweh's leading with care. God performs those things which bring life. And he reveals his control of the life of our, what we're doing. So who's, who is the one operating? Who's the one sitting on the throne of our hearts? And in that, it gives us this picture of this Izer of Israel. Now, you may be familiar with that term. We've talked about that many, many times. The Izer Konegdo, where do you hear that? That is what many call the helpmeet or what Mrs. Adam was created to do. And, but, and you can go back to my Walking Dead series, Walking Dead and Face to Face and Let the Women Be Silent to further get an explanation of what an Isaac Connecto is, this help me. But it's not a picture of a helper because God's not just a helper. It's, if you put Yahweh as your, just your helper, then you are missing who he is. And most people are completely surprised because when you look in Iser, just as an Iser connecto for the woman, but what is an Iser when it comes to God? It's like a military aid, a guide, a rescuer. And that's that's what that woman is. Now, we're not here to discuss that right now, but we look over and over in scripture and it says Exodus 18, 4, the other was named Eliezer for he said, the God of my father was my Iser and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. My help my protector, which is it? And there is none like the God of Yerushalayim Yer who rides the heavens to your Iser and through the skies in his majesty. Now, both of those cases, it's it's been translated as help. But again, it has this idea of this rescuer. He is a rescuer. And then in Psalm 33, 20, our soul waits for Yahweh. He is our help, our Izer and our shield, our rescuer, the military aid. Psalm 70, verse five, but I am afflicted and needy. Hasten to me, O Yahweh, for you are my help, my Izer and my deliver. O Lord, do not delay. Okay, one more time. He is this, this help. He's far more than a help. He's our deliverer. He is the one that takes care of everything for us. It, he is the one that is this rescuer, this military aid, this guide and this lead. And that's that word guide. I mean, that's what we have this picture of as leading us beside these still waters, guiding us to that place where where we are protected, we're safe completely within him. And then we have Hosea 13, 9, and is your destruction or Israel that you are against me, against your help. Okay, your eyes are. These, this word is used to describe our, our Izer, our king. And that's what he is. He's the Izer of Israel. He's our Izer. And he, he's supposed to be in control of what we're doing if we let him be. 
because we've handed him control of our lives. And when we realize that it's his control, then the chaos is not going to be there. And the things that we will do, the things that we would do and should do are those things that he has led us to do, to do. But without his control in our life, our life is what? It's that same word that we talked about for water, chaos. Without his control, our life is going to spin in directions we don't want it to spin. But we don't have to fear when he's the one that's leading us because the waters are no longer full of chaos. They're still. And that's this idea of control that his deeds bring life and cause us to produce life. So that's the purpose of leading is so that we can follow in what he's already done. All right. So let's look at my manuka, manuka. Okay. That's still waters. We're looking at lead. Now let's look at still waters one more time. Okay. We think about a mikvah. We think about running waters full of life. But I think you heard me say this before. When waters are still, what are they generally like? If you go about where waters are not moving, are there waters that you want to go hang out with beside? Would you want to get in them? Usually they're green and mucky and murky. That's true. The really still waters <laughs> oftentimes are kind of stagnant. Stagnant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Covered with algae and lots of bugs. And you would say there's nothing refreshing about those waters. We like the flowing water. In fact, usually we vacation there. And think about that. I, I always tell John, I say, it's not a vacation unless I've been around water. I love water. I like to go hang out in water, be a part. I do. Have, how many times have I said that? It's not a vacation for me unless I've been around water. That's true. It is very true. I say it all the time because there's something that's peaceful and refreshing and calming. In fact, one of the things we love to do is go float in a river. So it's this moving river and we just talk for hours. Doesn't There's not a lot of activity, but we find it refreshing. Would you say? Well, yeah, we do. And, and in the very still parts of those waters, there are there's different things that are just kind of floating about. I'm not, you know, that's not where we're focused, but no, yeah. but, but we, you know, you were, you had brought it up, but it's in the areas that there's more rapids. There's nothing just hanging out in the water. It's all washed clean. So, that's but true. I was going to, I was going to say this, Sandy, um, we met uh, going to the river and, we and we went to whitewater rafting we weren't floating in a tube, but in our younger days, we did float in the. I would raft. still do that. I would love to do that. It's so much fun. Okay, but we're not here to yeah, discuss. We're digressing, but that's we. But it wasn't vacation unless we were in the water. And, and, uh, and you know what? That's people. What well, even if you're in in the winter time, you're often in a lake or it, by a lake in a cabin or a stream or something, or an ocean. I mean, that's sort of a common place. And so there's a reason, there's a reason that we're drawn to the water. But besides that physical thing that draws us that, to the water itself, Yahweh wants to lead us to that place of rest, a place of trust, a place where he has taken us, where he's calmed the chaos, this place of confidence where we completely rely and focus on him. And also when you're beside waters that are still, there's not a lot that's going to distract you. Your focus will be on him. Your focus will be on what he's done. He wants to take the heavy load from our life and he wants to give us shalom. He wants to give us peace and rest. And he He wants to replace it with those things. And we oftentimes fight him all the way. Let's look at Matthew 11 and we're going to look at verses 28 through 30. All right. So we have uh, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Disciples in a boat, they just saw a miraculous feeding of 4,000, 4,000 or 5,000. Don't remember which one it was, but they're in a boat. They're well, out there's, the two, 
they're in the okay, middle of the okay. Sea of Galilee, and the winds are against them. It's a storm. The waves are tossing. They're struggling, and Yeshua is not in the boat. And and so then in the midst of the stone and the storm, all of a sudden get the so it's a the midst of the storm. It's in the midst of the storm. They they look up and Yeshua is walking on the water towards them and is about to overtake them. And they cry out, Oh, it's it's a ghost. And that's how the King James Version says it. You know, it's a spirit, it's an ad, uh, you know. It's it's something that's not real, and and uh, and Yeshua says it is I, if I remember right. I may be paraphrasing it. Forgive me if I am. And uh, Peter says, if it is you, then beckon me, and I'll to come to you. And of course, that's when we have Peter sinking, and Yeshua pulls him up, and oh, you little faith, and he gets him in the boat. And as soon as he gets in the boat, everything's still. And they're at the other side. And we, we, we have to recognize that we may be in the water, and that water is chaotic. We are in a storm of life. And the only place where it's safest is when Yeshua, we allow Yeshua into our boat and we reach our destination. And I was just thinking about that in terms of the Good Shepherd. Sometimes we leave the shepherd behind and we get to the wrong water. But once he arrives, he'll make that water right. That's exactly yeah. right. Because and he is the living water. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it takes that. Sometimes we have to stop. Not that we haven't disinvited him, but maybe we need to actively invite him into the midst of that storm so that the chaos will be still. Well, it says that's what that whole idea is on the word being led is that he is the one that will control the chaos so that our de through his deeds and then our, our actions will reflect that as well. It's that pyramid structure, but we've got to allow the living water to come in. Let's look at John 4, 4, 13. John 4, 13. Yeshua answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again. And whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into each everlasting life. Okay, but did you say that everyone who drinks, that means there's something we have to do. We have to drink the water. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Mm -hmm. There's a choice there. There's a choice there. And it... And that just goes to say, we've got to be connected, not only resting beside those waters where he has satisfied us completely and satisfied the and stopped the chaos around us so we don't have to worry about tomorrow or the rest of it. But we have to choose to drink. We have to choose one more time to get into that word. So let's continue to work, look at that word still, because I want that menuat, the plural form of that, nuwa, means to rest, to repose, to be quiet, to relax. One more time, if you hear the word rest, what do you connect that with? Sabbath. Sabbath is our rest. Ab Abraham Herschel, Heschel says to the biblical mind, menua is the same as happiness and stillness and peace and harmony. It is the state in which there is no strife and no fighting and no fear, no distrust. The essence of the good life is menucha. And the latter time, menucha became a synonym for the life in the world to come, for eternal life. So here we have, back to your analogy, back to when you talked about Yeshua calming the storm. Because one more time, life is that storm. But what contrasts to that storm of life? It's Sabbath. It's rest. It's the harmony we find on Sabbath. Sabbath. It's that shalom. It's that peace. And each time we enter into Sabbath, we find ourselves what? We're sheltered. We're, it's, it's as if we're in this ark and we're floating over these waters that where all strife and striving is gone because we're resting in him. And each time we experience his presence on that day, 
we know that we've been fed, we've been clothed, we're sheltered, and we're guided by Yahweh himself, the good shepherd. That's this picture coming back full circle where we do find these still waters as he's taking care of us when we're completely exhausted, when we're weak, but where there's something that happens in Sabbath when we're beside those waters and that is restoration, restoration. And we find that through him on it because he is the source of life. He is the source of living water, Hmm. but we've got to participate. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we do have to participate in Shabbat. That's really the key because if we go over to uh, Hebrews three, eleven, where it's it's quoted about um, about the Israelites in the wilderness, where he says, "I swore in my anger they will never enter my rest," and and so. What is it that they were not able to enter into and why? It's because they had hardened their hearts. And, and this is where it says before that, oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of testing in the wilderness. There your fathers tested me and tried me and they saw that my works for 40 years. Therefore, I... I became provoked at that generation and said, their hearts are always wandering and they have not known my ways. As I swore in my anger, they will never enter my rest. And so it goes on. So see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has an evil, unbelieving heart and forsakes the living God, but exhort one another as long as it's called today that none of you become hardened by sin's deception for we have become partners with Messiah. If in fact we hold our initial confidence firm until the end and, and it goes on um, and it's in verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They couldn't get that rest, but that word for rest is in the Greek is kataposis. Uh Kataposis. And I, I hope, I don't know if you were going to go there with that word, but you know what it means? It means a putting to rest, a calming of the winds and a resting place. So uh, it, it goes right along with this whole analogy of the, the, the storm and the sea, the whole analogy of where we're being led to the still waters. And what is the still waters? It is Shabbat. It's where where we we make we sometimes we have to make the week stop in order to find rest where there is a calming of the winds there's a calming of the storms there's a calming of of all the events of our life to we we say uh uh-uh, uh that's not going to break in this is the time of rest and and but the thing is is that he's already he's put the parentheses around shabbat and we enter in through the door of the first set of parentheses, we are in a bubble until we exit those parentheses. And that's what the rest is about. It's that fixed, tranquil place already set aside for the week, set aside for the week. And we can choose either, either to go there or not. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just excited about this. But here's, here's the other part of it is why did they not enter into it before? Is because they had an unbelieving heart. They didn't think that the Shabbat was really that day that set apart. That's why so many Sunday Christians have a hard time with Saturday because there's unbelief about that day. How many times do, do we, if, if we break Shabbat, is it, is it, is it because it's just, we have to get something done or is it because we lack faith? And so therefore our, 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 our sanctuary day is being encroached upon by something that we thought couldn't be handled. So we had to handle it. Right. And we didn't believe God to handle it. And we go back to that word trust. Do we trust him? Because when we are, Beside those waters, we've got to trust that he's taking care of everything for us 
so that we can rest. When we refuse to rest in Shabbat with him, then we do not trust him that he has calmed the chaos around us, that he's going to take care of us and he's going to supply to make sure that we're satisfied in those green pastures. And that's that's really a, a good place to stop before we go to verse three next week, because it, we've looked at it from both both angles. We've looked at it from Shabbat, but we've also looked at it as he's the one that's taking care of us when we're at our weakest point. And he's the one that knows where the good water is, for he is the living water. He is the, the water that satisfies his word, his presence. So anyway, it is time for the second part, us to go to the second part of our show. And we are so glad that you joined us. But there's more. There's more to hear. Am I correct, John? Well, absolutely. So tonight you want to join us on the Craig Report. On the other side, you're going to catch us only on Twitch and on the website. So, or, and if you go to the website, you can watch it at the first one. If it seems to be buffering on you, scroll down to the very bottom and you can pull up the Twitch feed all by itself. You'll see it there and you can watch it on the Twitch feed there. It should work. Or you can just uh, get the Twitch app. And also just and and catch it that way because that way the streaming is not unbroken and uh, so we've got some things to talk about on tonight's edition of the Craig Report so yeah please join me on the other side all right so until next time shalom, shalom.